Well, it is about time for us to get started this morning. So I was on Facebook just for a second this morning, and one of our good friends up in Wisconsin drove to Church in the Snow. So it is a little bit different here, and I am very thankful for that. It's a beautiful day out, and it's a wonderful time to be together and study God's Word some more together. <clears throat> It has been a couple weeks since we have, well, three weeks since we have done uh, our class on Acts. We've had a couple of things come up, uh, both with Caleb being here and with us being gone. So uh, we're going to be uh, at least getting close to wrapping up Acts. If we don't wrap it up today, we'll wrap it up next week. Either way, um, I might have a couple other things I want to uh, throw out there, kind of summarizing the book. Um, and then after that, we're going to get into uh, some... It's, it's going to be a class, but I don't know exactly how we're going to uh, structure it yet in terms of, I don't know that we'll have like an outline as much as we'll just kind of be working through it, but uh, we're going to be looking at evangelism and looking at how we can um, you know, talk to people about scripture, how we can uh, feel comfortable talking to people about scripture and uh, approaching things in that way. And I think that'll be a very good study uh, for us. So uh, be looking forward to that as well after we wrap up Acts. But uh, this morning we are getting back into Acts 28 as we wrap up this book. Let's go ahead and have a prayer as we begin. Father God in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful for the privilege and the honor of being your children. This is something that we cannot possibly deserve on our own. This is not something that uh, we have in any way earned. Far from it, we have proven ourselves to be unholy in the face of you, our holy God. And yet through Christ, we can be made holy again. We can be reconciled. The stains of our sin can be removed through his blood. And we are forever grateful for that fact. And Father, we are mindful this morning as we're gathered here of uh, many who are not able to be with us. Uh, we're mindful of those who are struggling at this time. Father, we pray that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, strengthen them, and help them to keep their focus on you no matter what may come. And Father, we ask that you would bless us as we are striving to follow the example of our brothers and sisters throughout time, ever since the first century, as we've been studying about. Help us to have their boldness, their confidence, their zeal, Father, and help us to be a light in this community and around the world as we are striving to share the message of the gospel with others. Father, we ask that you would please forgive us for our sins and bless us as we study this morning. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Quick overview, since it has been a couple weeks since we've looked at this. So, uh, Paul is now pretty much in Rome. We uh, have the shipwreck, and that took a while for us to kind of uh, piece all that together, but we had the shipwreck, and uh, he eventually, they eventually uh, crash the ship on Malta, if you will. They lose the ship, but everyone's saved, and while he's there, Paul has an opportunity to uh, heal. Paul has an opportunity to demonstrate some supernatural ability, and while we're not told, of course, that uh, he preaches the gospel, we're not explicitly told that. It's certainly implied because we see the beginnings of the same pattern we've seen throughout the book. So I think Luke expects us to see, well, of course, this is going to be his in, if you will, to uh, showing them, hey, you saw what I just did? Well, let me tell you about how I did it and the power uh, that allows me to do that. So we see him through there. He's able to have a lot of influence even with the ruler of that island. But finally, once uh, the seasons change again, they're there for several months, remember, uh, travel is not an overnight thing like it is for us with planes and so forth. Uh, they're there for several months, but finally when the weather changes again, they're able to actually sail uh, to the, uh, the, I guess, country, if you will, or province, really, of Italy. And so we got down to uh, verse 14, uh, where it says, we found brothers, uh, of course there are Christians uh, in this area, and we're invited to stay with them for seven, seven days, and so we came to Rome. So now Paul is in Rome. This has been kind of the end goal, really, for uh, a long time in this book. This is where he's been headed. It's <clears throat> interesting, excuse me, that while we had Paul's parallel with him going towards Jerusalem and something bad happening in that parallel with Jesus going to Jerusalem and something bad going to happen, we now have a different journey that we've been following with Paul, that he's now going somewhere else. And yes, again, he's going there for a trial, but we see this time that's more of an opportunity. 
And that's what we're going to see as Luke begins to conclude this book of what that opportunity looks like uh, for Paul. So uh, verse 15, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, talking about the brothers in Rome, came as far as the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. These are real places. These are uh, kind of just outside. I guess you could almost say they're not really suburbs as much as uh, maybe the first places you enter along certain roads going into Jerusalem, or to Rome, rather. And so uh, the, the Appian Forum, the three taverns, they meet them there. And it says, on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Why is it so important that Luke wants to tell us these Christians come to see them and Paul takes courage. Why, why does Luke throw in that little detail here? I mean, they're in Rome. Christians are coming to see them. Okay, fine, but that's not really where the main focus is going. He's, he's moving towards his trial and all these kind of things. Why does Luke tell us that? What have we seen from Paul for the last several chapters? What's his attitude been? He's meant to go to Rome. Okay. Okay. He's meant to go to Rome. So how have we seen him handling that? Okay. Even before he gets to Jerusalem, he everyone's warning him, no, don't go through with it. He's bold. He's going to go through with it. And then uh, as he's standing, well, first of all, as he's standing before the mob, then as he's standing before Felix and Festus and Agrippa, we see him being very bold. We see him being very confident. This is a reminder, I think, that Paul is still human. It says when he sees the brethren, he takes courage and he thanks God. Paul still is scared. Paul still is afraid. That does not in any way negate his courage, as I think we've talked about before. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is choosing to move forward in spite of fear. Paul is still human, just like Jesus was. Jesus himself had a great deal of fear right before the cross. Remember him in the garden. So Paul is encouraged by this. This is bolstering his spirits. Almost, and I don't know if there's an intentional parallel here, but I think at least we can kind of see one ourselves, in that just as after Jesus prays in the garden, the angels minister to him, well here, just as he's about to face one of his biggest trials, literally, right, a trial, he has brethren who are ministering to him and encouraging him here. So that's very significant. Again, providence allowing for Paul to have uh, more courage beyond even uh, what has already been provided for him. Verse 16, when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So we have him staying by himself, uh, meaning that he is allowed essentially to be under house arrest. That's usually how we describe this situation for Paul. He's under house arrest. He's not in a prison or in a dungeon with a bunch of other prisoners. He's allowed to stay by himself. Uh, he, of course, has a guard. He is still in custody. Um, but... I guess essentially, before you have electronics, this is, you know, the, the ancient version of having a, a, an ankle monitor or whatever that won't allow you to get out. The, the soldier, you have a human ankle monitor, I guess, in a sense. So that's basically his situation. Now, why would Paul be allowed to have such a privileged situation in custody? The story had to follow what Paul had done and what he'd say, how much he had saved the soldiers. Oh. Okay. And which made him probably fairly popular with the soldiers. Too. Okay, very good. You think that the soldiers who all of their lives have been saved because of this man are going to tell someone about that? I think probably so. That's going to be, I mean, not to mention just beyond basic human nature that you would want to share that. You also have the idea of superstition. Roman soldiers, just like any other pagan peoples, are typically superstitious. And so to have this kind of in a way, mysterious man who uh, happens to be able to do these things, well, that's, that's going to get out. So I think that's definitely part of it. What else? Is there anything else that would uh, allow for this kind of situation? I think a lot of it has to do with providence. Without Paul, they were able to teach. Okay, good. 
I think all of the reasons that contribute to him being allowed to do this are providential, absolutely, because this allows him to be much more effective and free to proclaim the gospel while he's in Rome. And I think also, not to mention just the soldiers in general, I think also we have already been told the centurion was favorable toward him, and the centurion uh, has you know, seen him uh, even maybe in a more... Uh, immediate context than the soldiers. You know, he's had more uh, uh, more direct dealings with Paul. But it also probably doesn't hurt that Felix and Festus and Agrippa all essentially have said that he's innocent, except he still needs to go to Caesar. And that probably has, at least in some form, been passed on as part of his case. You know, I don't know if they had a case file in the way that we do now in a court system, but uh, there would at least be some kind of report sent to Caesar uh, to kind of give background before Caesar hears this case. And so all those things together, the fact that Paul handled himself the way he did, of course, uh, through inspiration, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say, it'll be given to you. So uh, through his inspiration, Paul handles things the way he does before these men. Paul is able to save the Roman soldiers all those things contribute to where now through providence, he has the best possible situation, arguably, that he could have uh, under his circumstances to proclaim the gospel. And that is a, an amazing thing that we see here. So he is here. He has a degree of freedom. He's in Rome now. Uh, he is able to uh, do all these things. And it says, after three days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll read that in just a second. But I want us to think about another part of this question. Why isn't he immediately brought to Caesar like the next day? Why is he having to wait? I mean, we're actually going to see, <clears throat> jumping ahead a little bit, he's going to have to wait. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's going to have to wait at least two years before he's going to get an audience with Caesar. Why does he have to wait? Okay. Caesar's a busy man, right? Uh, again, we want to put this in real-world context. How long does it take today for us, if we're in a court case situation, to actually get our day in court? At least months, usually, right? If not years. And that's not for the leader of the entire country. That's for you know, usually some local or regional judge, maybe even a state judge if we're going like, you know, a high-end court case. But it still takes years and years and years. And that person's only job, that judge's only job, is to judge. Caesar has to do a whole lot of things. His only job, by no means, is just to judge criminal cases of people who have appealed to him. So uh, we see, again, this is very real to life. He has to wait because you think other people have appealed to Caesar? Well, yeah. You think Caesar spends every day doing these kind of cases? Not at all. So this is going to take some time, but that is time that Paul is able to use. So what does he use this time for? Let's look at verse 17 uh, in more detail. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now let's begin to figure out what he's doing. Why is he calling the Jews together? Remember, we've already established there are Christians in Rome, but he's calling the Jews together. Why? That's why he was sent here. Okay. He's sent there to proclaim the gospel, not just to hang out with the ones who are already Christians. Very good. We've seen him already when he enters a city, going to Jews first, because they already understand some fundamental concepts, at least, that should put them closer to Christianity than others. Why else? Especially when he's here in Rome. Why does he want to get the Jewish leaders in Rome together? Beyond providence of him spreading the gospel in Rome, why is he in Rome? Maybe he's trying to show that he's been falsely convicted. Or okay, good. Who accused him? Why is he here? Jews. 
the Jews are the ones who accused him. So without even thinking about the religious as or I guess the, the uh, evangelistic aspect of he's trying to help them understand the gospel, which is certainly the main focus, but even just from a, I guess you could say, strategic standpoint, if he's being accused by Jews, but he can get the local Jews with whom Caesar is more familiar to at least be on his side and not gang up on him with the other Jews who have accused him, well, that'll be very helpful, right? So even just from a practical standpoint, uh, this is a good move. He's trying to uh, essentially paint the Jews who have accused him as isolated and not as representative of all Jews seeing him as an enemy. So he calls the local leaders of the Jews together. Remember, we're told uh, that there were a substantial amount of Jews in Rome. At a certain point, they were removed from Rome, if you remember, with Aquila and Priscilla. But now they have been allowed back into Rome. And so uh, there, are, uh, there is a contingent of Jews in Rome. We're not exactly sure how many. But he gathers them together. And here's how he starts off. He says, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our, our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Why does he start off by saying, I didn't do anything against our customs, but I was still delivered to, to the Romans? What does that accomplish? <clears throat> what you said is getting them on his side. Okay. And he's not in any way circumventing what actually happened. He is addressing the accusations against him head on. And that's key here. And not only that, we're talking about Jews who are living in Rome. Of course, there are Jews spread throughout the Roman Empire at this point, especially throughout uh, Asia and, and that area, as well as uh, as far as Italy, at least. While, yes, they are not living in Judea, so they probably are at least more comfortable with the culture that they're in. If they're Jews, if they're practicing Jews, what can we assume about how they feel about the Romans? At the very least, they view them as the others, right? As, as different, as not one of us. At the very least. Now, they might not see them as enemies in the same way that the Judeans would see them as enemies, but at the very least, I would say that they see them as, you know, not one of us. And so automatically, not only is he addressing this thing head on, he's also saying, the Jews in Judea turned me over to the pagans. So this is almost a statement of I was betrayed by our own people kind of a thing, which is, again, meant to, uh, I guess you could say, help them sympathize with him, help him say, wow, that you've been treated unfairly, which he has, right? Let's move on to verse 18. When they has, had examined me, and wished to set, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Okay. Can the Jews... I hate to say look it up, because that implies our kind of technology, but can the Jews research this claim? Can the Jews, the Jewish leadership, can they figure out if Paul is telling the truth here? What do they have to go on? Okay. Think about how he's presenting this. They wish to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. If they want to... Do you think the Jewish leadership could find a messenger to inquire of the, the rulers? I mean, this remember, our system of law here in America today has a lot, is, is in debt, I guess we could say, to uh, many of the Roman practices of law and justice and so forth and the justice system uh, all the way back in this time period. They have a very strong sense of things must be done justly. People who are on trial must have a fair trial, those kind of things. Now, maybe not to the same degree in certain cases, but at least in terms of the ideal in the Roman mind. So they are going to keep records. They are going to have uh, things that can be verified like this. If they wanted to, I, I believe that we have good evidence 
they can verify this information. If nothing else, they could at least ask the centurion because the centurion has some inside information, right? The centurion who delivered him there. Uh, they could ask him. They could uh, verify this. The, the, the point is by, again, addressing this head on, but not only that, saying he's already essentially been declared innocent unofficially, he is continuing to build his case so that the Jews recognize, I'm, I'm here having been falsely accused. And he builds on that even in 19. I want us to notice this especially. Because the Jews objected, verse 19, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. Why is it so important for him to say, number one, he was compelled to appeal, and number two, he doesn't have a charge against the nation? Why is it so important for him to make those points? Okay, good. Especially he doesn't have a charge against the nation. He's saying, I don't have a problem with my countrymen. I am not here trying to get my countrymen in trouble at all. I didn't want any of this. I just was forced into the situation. I think that especially factors into that second part. Why is it important for him to say he was compelled to appeal? Even in our court system today, why do you appeal? Do what? Okay, you're trying to prove your innocence. Usually you have to appeal because you're found guilty if you're the defendant, and you're like, no, I'm not, and so you appeal so that you can actually be found innocent later. That's usually what an appeal is for, is there was something wrong in the trial, and you're, you're trying to uh, clar clarify that you were innocent. And so it would be logical for the Jews to assume if he had to appeal to Caesar, that means he probably was found guilty and wants a second shot. And so he's clarified, no, that's not what happened at all. I was compelled to appeal to Caesar uh, because of what was forced on me by the Jews. I had already essentially been declared innocent by those who tried me. That's a unique situation, but uh, he's making that very clear because he is on every count affirming his innocence, offering evidence of his innocence, and also making it crystal clear, I have nothing against my countrymen whatsoever. All of that is extremely uh, important in how he is presenting himself to these Jews. Verse 20, for this reason, so he's given this introduction to the Jews. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. What is the hope of Israel? The hope of spreading the gospel. Oh, okay. Yes. In truth, it is. But these are Jews, so they're not Christians yet. So to them, what is the hope of Israel? Let's reword it that way. To a Jew who is not a Christian, what is the hope of Israel? Okay, it would vary to some extent in terms of exactly what the hope of Israel looked like, depending on the sect of the Jews you might be affiliated with and so forth. But the basic idea is the Messiah, the restoration of the kingdom, freedom, restoration of uh, the, the worship of God at the temple, all those kinds of things. Not that the temple wasn't standing, but in, in a more free sense. All of that is kind of built into this idea. Even Jews who don't live in Judea are holding out for this hope. This is part of their basic identity as Jews, is we have hope that one day the promises to our fathers will be brought to pass. Now, of course, as Byron pointed out, they don't understand that this is a spiritual thing that has been promised, but nonetheless, they still have this idea that there is a coming hope uh, rooted in the Messiah, rooted in the kingdom, and all these kinds of things. So by saying this, what is Paul doing? By saying, I'm here because of the hope of Israel. Okay, so good. One of the things he's doing is he's giving a segue so that as he progresses in actually presenting the gospel, he will be able to, remember when I mentioned the hope of Israel? Let me tell you what that actually is. Very good. As far as him building this relationship with the Jews, 
What does it do for him to say, I'm here because of the, I'm in chains because of the hope of Israel? He's essentially saying, I'm on your side. We all want the same thing. We all believe in the same ultimate goal. Now, again, as Bunny said, what that looks like, a proper understanding of it, he is going to get to very soon. But he's starting off with, here's what we have in common. This is part of their very identity. He's saying, I'm here suffering because I believe in what you believe. It's very interesting that that's how he approaches this. He's, again, he's trying to make allies here in Rome, even among those who, in other places, have historically been his enemies, his opponents. He's trying to make allies here. So, uh, that's what he says here. Then in verse 21, here's their response. They said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. Now, interesting, before we get into what they actually say, when they say brothers, who are they talking about? None of the brothers have sent letters or, or come here and spoken evil. Who are brothers here? Are these Christians? Fellow Jews. We have to remember, especially in the book of Acts, Brothers can be used in terms of brothers, ethnically speaking, or brothers in terms of, uh, of, of Christianity, so spiritually speaking. If we're talking about Jews who aren't Christians saying someone's a brother, they're talking about Jews, right? So they're saying, not only have we not gotten any official letters from Judea regarding you specifically— we also haven't heard from any Jews who have been traveling through speaking negatively about you specifically. That's interesting. Why wouldn't they have heard about Paul? Hasn't he been doing a whole lot of things that have stirred up the Jews? Why wouldn't they have gotten any information about Paul specifically? Ultimately, the answer is we don't know, right? It would kind of seem like uh, the, the, the Jews in Jerusalem would have, the Jewish leadership specifically, would have tried to, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, get ahead of the ball here and, and even turn the Jews in Rome against him, but... We have to remember communication is not as easy as it uh, is now. We have to remember that, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to travel and all those kinds of things. And there also is the fact that you have uh, Paul being essentially missing for a while because of the shipwreck and everything. So uh, perhaps once news of that gets back, maybe uh, they're like, oh, well, we're not going to have to hear from him again anyway. I, we don't know exactly why, but I think, again, whatever the case— this is another example of providence. These Jews haven't already been turned against him before he can even defend himself. You know, you think about it. If you're about to meet someone that you've never met before, and someone tells you something about them, whether good or bad, but especially bad, before you meet them, does that change the interaction once you actually meet them? I'm not saying should it. I'm saying does it. It usually does, right? If you're told before you meet someone, oh, this person's a jerk, oh, this person's arrogant, oh, this person's whatever, typically speaking, that's going to change how you interact when you first meet them. Just because that's in your head now. Now, should it? Probably not. But that's usually how it works. So for whatever reason, that hasn't happened here. Paul has an open opportunity with these Jews and he is going to be able to take advantage of that, as we're going to see. Verse 22. But, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, this almost seems to contradict, but, but let's look at it. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For, with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Now, doesn't this contradict what they just said in verse 21 about not hearing anything?
They just said this sect, talking about Christianity, is spoken against everywhere. How do we mesh that with verse 21? What do they say in verse 21? We haven't heard any letters from Judea. None of the brothers have reported any evil. What? About you, concerning you. They haven't gotten any specific information about Paul. They don't really know much about Paul and what he's been doing. They have heard of Christianity. Remember, there's Christians already in Rome. There's Christians throughout Asia Minor. There's Christians in Greece. So they've heard of Christianity. In fact, while they haven't heard anything negative about Paul, they have heard things negative about Christianity, but clearly they don't know much about it. And so while they keep on hearing bad things about it, they don't really understand, I guess you could say, what, what to make of these bad things. How should we piece all this together? And they're willing to listen to Paul because he hasn't, how should we say this? He hasn't already been eliminated as a credible source at this point uh, to these Jews. So they want to know. They want to know, I guess you could say, from the horse's mouth, from an actual Christian Jew, they want to know what this stuff is that they've heard about. Because they have heard negative things, but they want to know more. They want to verify uh, this seemingly very uh, vague information that they've heard. So... When they appointed a day for him, verse 23, so they, they, they schedule an appointment, right? When they appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Now, that's interesting in several ways. First of all, it's interesting that so many are willing to listen. Again, I think we see providence here that they haven't already closed off their minds to this, uh, this teaching. Notice, from morning till evening. I don't know about y'all, I would get exhausted if I was up here teaching something from morning till evening. And I don't think anybody would be left by the time we got to evening, right? But that's how long he takes, and that's how long they stay. They're willing to stay and listen that whole time as he's trying to explain to them, again, as we talked about, I think Buddy mentioned earlier, this idea of the hope of Israel, what exactly that hope truly is. They all believe in the hope of Israel, but he's now trying to tell them this is what it actually is, not what you thought it was, what it actually is. From morning to evening, he expounded them. And notice, he's testifying to the kingdom of God, to the mind of a Jew versus the mind of a Christian, those mean two very different things, right? And trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law and from the prophets. So, I think that's important here. How does he try to convince them? Remember, this is Paul. Can Paul perform miracles right in front of them to prove that the gospel is true? Of course, he's done it a million times. And yet, how does he choose to try and prove this? He goes to their own scriptures, what they believe, to uh, the very foundation of their faith, and shows them, here's where you went wrong. Both in the law of Moses and the prophets. Because you have references to Jesus in both the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and the prophets. Certainly, we think of uh, the prophets as having the most messianic prophecies, right? Isaiah particularly. But he's going there to their own, their own works, their own law, to help them understand Jesus. Help them understand the kingdom. And some were convinced by what he said, verse 24. But others disbelieve. All right. We've looked so many times throughout our study of the book of Acts at the response of different groups of Jews to the message. And now we kind of see a mixture, right? Some are convinced, some disbelieve. Why are the ones who are convinced convinced? Not only from this verse, but just putting together what we've seen throughout Acts. The ones who are convinced, why are they convinced? Because they don't have a preconceived 
Let's say in the way that you think. Okay. But so many Jews are so set on being an earthly kingdom. Okay. All of them are hearing the same thing, right? All of them have the evidence perfectly laid out. I think about if you go to the book of Hebrews, right, just how well uh, the writer of Hebrews lays out clearly this was always what uh, the Mosaic law and, and all of that was leading to was Jesus Christ. That's essentially, you know, in probably different words, but that's essentially what Paul is doing here. Everyone's hearing the same thing. Some are convinced because they're willing to listen. They're willing to accept. They see the truth and they're like, okay, I'll accept it. Why do the ones who don't believe not believe? Well, as Ray said, they're the ones who won't let go of what they've thought. They're the ones who won't let go of those preconceived ideas. This is the way they believe it must be. This is the interpretation that they are familiar with, that they are comfortable with, and they're not willing to change. In disagreeing among themselves, verse 25, they departed after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Why quote this scripture? After all, some have been convinced. Why, why is he quoting this scripture? There, there's this disagreement among them, and he says this, and then they leave. Why? Why, why does he say this here? Prophecy fulfilled. Okay, this is prophecy fulfilled. This should sound familiar, right? Jesus quotes this same thing when he's dealing with Jews as well, who won't believe. It almost seems like Paul's not even giving them much time. But what is he doing here? By putting this, this prophecy out there, seeing they may not see, hearing they may not hear and understand, what does this do for this, these Jews? I would argue Paul's not giving up on them. He's not writing them off. He's pushing them to make a decision. They're disagreeing. They're debating. He says, listen, this is exactly what Isaiah said would happen. And by the way, if you go here, this is actually in Isaiah 6 is where he's quoting from. If you go to this text, you know what comes right after this? You know what Isaiah says right after uh, they won't see or hear or understand? It's judgment. In the case of Isaiah, it's judgment in the form of conquest from Babylon. But it's judgment. So Paul's pushing them. He's saying, you've got to choose. You've got to make a decision. This is it. Therefore, he says in verse 28, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Again, he's not saying, I'm never going to talk to a Jew ever again. He's saying, I'm going to put my focus on those who are actually open and not sticking with their preconceived ideas. Verses 30 and 31, as we conclude the book. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and with all hindrance. So the book ends on a hopeful note. I think it ends so abruptly because Luke's writing after two years have passed. Nothing more has happened yet. But Paul continues to be able to preach. He continues to be able to spread the gospel in the capital of the world. We've gone from a few people in Jerusalem to a man proclaiming the gospel in the capital of the world. We'll have a few more thoughts uh, kind of wrapping up Acts and probably transitioning into what we're going to look at uh, next week. Any other thoughts before we close? Thank you.